So we're moving now to the final element of negligence, which is damages. Unlike intentional torts, where you could get nominal damages even if you couldn't prove any actual injury or harm, in negligence you must have damage and the plaintiff must be able to prove what those damages are. Now there's two types of damages that I'll talk about in this lecture. One is compensatory and the other is punitive. And I'll give a very brief overview of each before I move into the specifics as we go forward. Compensatory damages are designed, as the name suggests, to compensate the plaintiff for the plaintiff's injuries. The goal really is to try to put the plaintiff back in the position that he or she was in before the accident occurred. Um, I like to think of this as a kind of Humpty Dumpty justice. Remember there all the king's horses and all the king's men tried to put Humpty Dumpty back together after he fell off the wall. That's what we try to do in torts. We certainly can't recreate um, the exact position the plaintiff was in because we can't completely heal the plaintiff's wound, so to speak, but we can give the plaintiff some money and by doing that try to put the plaintiff back in his or her original position. We'll talk about two different types of compensatory damage. The first will be called economic or special damages. Those terms are used interchangeably, and these really refer to out-of-pocket expenses. And the second form of compensatory damage we'll discuss are non-economic or general damages, and you probably have heard of this as pain and suffering. Now the other form of damage is punitive damage, and here the goal is distinctly different. It's not to put the plaintiff back into the position that he or she was before, because compensatory damages already do that. So punitive damages serves two different purposes. These are social or public purposes. One is to punish the defendant for engaging in reprehensible behavior, and the other is to set a precedent to deter other people from engaging in the same behavior and perhaps to deter the defendant from doing the same thing. Now, because punitive damages can be um, very high in amount, courts have created a number of limits, and we'll talk about these limits momentarily, but there are certain restrictions on the kind of conduct that punitive damages can uh, attached to. There's also a limit on the burden of proof. We'll see that it's actually going to be higher than in a ordinary um, tort case or in the ordinary phases of a tort case. And finally, there's a constitutional limit based on due process. All right, let's start first with the economic or special damages. And we'll use the Martin versus U.S. case to illustrate some of these things. Remember, as I said at the outset, that this really concerns out-of-pocket expenses. These are the bills that the plaintiff has had to pay or will have to pay in the future as a result of um, the injury sustained and the treatments necessary in order to put the plaintiff back in the position that he or she was before and if the person has either been um, unable to work or has reduced the amount of work or actually has had to move from a higher paying job to a lower paying job, that all of those are economic losses that could be calculated. In the Martin case, we had a 12-year-old who hadn't yet entered the workforce, and so the difficult job there was to determine um, whether this child would be employed, what type of employment he might have, and then they calculate um, the recovery over the period of his work life. So let me review some of the factors that would go into all of this. The first is the past and future medical expenses. So certainly any expenses that the plaintiff has already incurred, perhaps surgeries or doctor visits, uh, maybe rehabilitation, up until the time of trial can be fully recovered, but also if the patient is likely to have future surgeries or require future treatment, all of that can be compensated as well. In the Martin case, it looks like this child had been severely injured as a result of um, striking. He was on the back of a, a motorbike and the motorbike struck a down electrical wire. And so it looked like he was going to have severe burn injuries that would require grafting and other forms of medical treatment in the future. So he could not only recover 
um, for the past medical expenses up to the time of trial, but also for whatever medical treatments he would have going forward. Um, if someone is already employed and they were forced to take time off because of their injury, they can get compensation for their lost wages. Um, but if their injury is in some way going to inhibit their ability to earn money in the future, that also is compensable. Now, for someone like this 12-year-old boy who hadn't yet entered the workforce, you can see from the case that the court and the jury has to project what that child might have done with his life. And that's a very difficult thing. You would look at the parents and what their occupation and education level is. You look at the child, his or her education level. In this case, they were even talking about the child's level, level of intellectual aptitude to determine whether he's likely to be in a skilled profession or skilled labor labor market, or if he would just simply be a, um, a laborer um, that is unskilled. And so that would kind of project how this child would live the rest of his life and what kind of earnings he might have. So here are some of the additional factors that you would look at. Um, of course, if the person already has the job, you'd look at the actual job or you'd project the type of job that the person or the child might have. You'd also, based on whatever um, occupation the person had or could have, look at the potential salary fluctuations for that occupation moving forward in time. Um, and you'd have to certainly determine based on the projected health of this person, how long they would be expected to work. And that sets parameters for the economic loss recovery based on um, lost either wages or earning potential. Of course, if there is property damage, like perhaps in the Martin case, the motorbike was destroyed, that could be compensated for, that is the value of it could be given to the plaintiff. But also if there are other economic expenses associated with the property damage, like perhaps having to rent another vehicle to replace the one that had been destroyed, that would be compensable as well. Now, whenever you're awarding damages for future types of expenses like the medical expenses or the wage loss, you have to project both the interest rate and the inflation rate. The reason is that if you give the plaintiff a lump sum now, um, that plaintiff could invest that money and the interest rate will allow that money to grow. And so money given now actually is more valuable moving forward because of the investment opportunity. But the flip side of that is that everything in life gets more expensive um, as we move in time, and that inflation rate diminishes the value of money that we have today. And so courts have to reconcile the contradictory trends in the interest rate and the inflation rate. And there's a variety of different ways that you can do that. The way that was chosen by the court in Martin was basically to have economists come in and to calculate um, both the interest rate and the inflation rate. And in that case, the economist said the interest rate would be 7.5 and the inflation rate was 5.5. And so basically you would do the offset there and you would uh, then based on that offset calculate the amount that would have to be awarded now to make up for those two factors. Other jurisdictions say that basically inflation and interest will be about the same moving forward over time. And so they say you don't even have to calculate it, that they negate each other. And so you can just simply award um, a present value for the future expenses and the interest rate and inflation rate will basically work themselves out. So the second form of compensatory damages are non-economic or general damages. And we'll use the Maraglia case to get kind of a handle on these forms of damages. Um, as I said at the outset, these are really pain and suffering type injuries, but there's actually a whole lot more involved. In the Maraglia case, we had a tragic accident of a construction worker who gets impaled on some rebar in a construction trench and had significant injuries, including severe nerve damage. It, it basically impaled his bowel, so he was going to have bowel problems for the rest of his life. And so there were enormous 
um, general or non-economic damage, pain and suffering type damage is awarded here. And the question is whether or not they were reasonable or excessive. So I want to use this case um, to discuss the forms or the types of non-economic damages. So we already said that pain and suffering, that is the actual physical pain that you suffer from your injuries, but also the emotional pain that you suffer, not only up to the time of trial, but also into the future, all of that is compensable. Um, you also can get compensation for disfigurement. And so I'm assuming this gentleman will have a very severe disfiguring scar that he'll have to deal with. And so he's entitled to compensation for um, whatever pain and suffering he endured up until the time of trial and having to live that life um, with that disfigurement moving forward. Um, another form of non-economic damage, an important one is loss of consortium. So if the person is married, um, the person's spouse can sue for loss of consortium. And that simply means the loss of society and comfort. In the past, it used to be the loss of sexual relations, but now it has more to do with the breakdown of the relationship between the spouses. Some courts also allow recovery between parents and children. Um, that's not quite as common. Usually it's spouses, and that also can be for past or future um, damage to the relationship. Now, there's really no economic formula for this. Really, the jury gets the evidence, and then the court basically gives them broad disc discretion to decide um, what the pain and suffering and disfigurement or the loss of life enjoyment is worth. And that's why a lot of these verdicts wind up getting appealed. Now, what does the court do to review these kinds of cases? Well, there's a number of factors that the Miragla court winds up looking at, and these include the nature of the injury, the plaintiff's age, um, the plaintiff's prior physical and mental condition, and the permanency of the injury. And you can see how each of these factors does shed some light on how devastating or grave the emotional impact might be on a particular person. Now, this is not the only list of factors, but it's a good working list for just having some sense as to what courts are looking for to evaluate a verdict in terms of its reasonableness or excessiveness. In this particular case, the judge, not the jury, but the judge received some evidence from both the plaintiff and the defendant about jury verdicts that had been given in prior cases where the circumstances were relatively similar and that gives the court a kind of baseline to determine whether or not the award in this case is within that range or falls perhaps outside of it. If the court does find that the award by the jury is excessive and perhaps based on prejudice or sympathy and not really based on the facts, then the court can grant what's called a remitter. And that's just a fancy way of saying that the court can order a reduction in the non-economic or general damages and basically say to the plaintiff, either you accept the reduced amount that I'm setting or I'm going to say that this was an unfair verdict and I'm going to award a new trial. And oftentimes the plaintiffs will accept the remitter because they don't want to have to retry the entire case. Because there are so few standards or limiting criteria for non-economic or general damages, a lot of state legislatures have now placed caps on non-economic damages. And oftentimes the cap will be set at a certain amount. Sometimes there will be factors that will influence the adjustment of that. But basically there is some upper limit. And so the parties basically know um, what the possible award could be. California does have a non-economic or general damage cap in medical malpractice cases, and that statute is called MICRA, and the cap is $250,000, regardless um, of the type of medical negligence, regardless of the age of the victim, the maximum that the victim can get in non-economic damages is $250,000. There was actually a uh, referendum 
on the ballot, I think about three or four years ago, where they tried to dramatically raise that amount, which was set in the 1970s, but the voters voted it down. Uh, and so we still have that $250,000 cap on non-economic damages in medical malpractice cases here in California. All right, the other form of damages that are recoverable in negligence are punitive damages. Now, as I mentioned originally, these are not designed to make the plaintiff whole. Punitive damages are really designed to punish the defendant for antisocial behavior or to deter the defendant and other parties from engaging in that kind of reprehensible conduct. Now, historically, juries have been given really broad discretion in deciding how much of a financial judgment to enter against the defendant in order to sufficiently punish him. But that creates a kind of problem because if we can't determine um, how much a defendant is going to be punished or the defendant can't know in advance what kind of conduct is going to result in what kind of financial penalty, then it appears like there is a lack of due process. Due process usually requires that there be some notice in advance of what punishment you'll face. And it also requires that the punishment be fair or reasonable. That is, it's not going to be arbitrary and capricious. And so courts started to create a number of factors that will help to ensure some degree of consistency in punitive damages. One is that the um, conduct involved must be either malicious, fraudulent, or reckless. Now, if it's malicious, it's probably intentional, and that would be covered by an intentional tort. Fraud is its own independent tort, which we haven't talked about. And so really, the only type of conduct that would fit within a negligence action is recklessness, which we've described as kind of the most extreme or egregious form of negligence. So unless you've got that really exceptional form of antisocial behavior, you can't even hope to recover punitive damages. Another way that you can put some limits on punitive damages is through the burden of proof. In fact, here we dramatically increase the burden of proof from the traditional preponderance of the evidence standard in tort or civil cases to clear and convincing evidence. So this is not quite as high as beyond a reasonable doubt, but it does require far more evidence by the plaintiff that the defendant really deserves this type of punishment. But even these kinds of considerations were viewed by the United States Supreme Court as being insufficient. And so in a series of decisions, the Supreme Court has decided to come out with its own list of factors which it has determined are indispensable to guaranteeing due process to a defendant. So the first is the reprehensibility of the defendant's conduct. And here the Supreme Court has tried to give greater clarity as to what constitutes re reprehensible conduct. Now, I don't have it here, but if you read the State Farm versus Campbell case, you'll see that the court laid out a number of considerations that are consistent with reprehensibility. And one of those is whether or not the harm inflicted by the defendant was physical as opposed to economic. In the State Farm case, the uh, plaintiff's insurance company had made a bad decision about allowing the plaintiff to go to trial. And ultimately, there was a judgment against the plaintiff that exceeded the plaintiff's liability limits in the policy, and so the plaintiff could be held personally liable. So here, the injury was an economic injury, not a physical injury, and that would be less worthy of punishment than the kind of physical injury that we get more worked up about. Another factor is whether there was a kind of indifference or callous indifference shown by the defendant to the health, safety, and welfare um, of the public. Another is whether or not the defendant had targeted folks who were financially vulnerable. And a final factor is whether or not the defendant engaged in a repeated pattern or practice of behavior that was antisocial or reprehensible. Now, there had been a problem in some of these cases where plaintiffs would bring in evidence of a pattern or practice of the defendant that exceeded um, the state in which the action was brought. That is, the 
plaintiff might show that defendant did the same thing to its customers or to people in a whole bunch of other states, perhaps even across the entire nation. Well, the Supreme Court said that that would be unconstitutional because a state doesn't have the power to punish for violations other than those that actually harm its own citizens. And so the court specifically said that for punitive damages to be fair and just, they can only punish for conduct that was committed inside the state. But even more specifically, the court said that this was really about punishing the defendant for the conduct that was directly related or targeted to the plaintiff. And so in deciding the reprehensibility factor, the um, court and the jury should really examine the extent to which the defendant's behavior was directed at the plaintiff. A second factor is the ratio between the compensatory damage award and the punitive award. And the court suggested that there are some guidelines that trial judges should follow in determining whether an award is acceptable or unconstitutional. Um, in a variety of opinions, the court suggested that a four to one ratio seemed to be about right. Um, and my ratio here is actually punitive to compensatory. So if there were a hundred thousand dollars of compensatory damages, a four hundred thousand dollar punitive award would seem to be right in the ballpark. The court doesn't really give any factual basis for this. I think it's more of a uh, subjective judgment that it seems about right. Um, and it's something that is not going to be astronomical and trigger a lot of appeals. The court also suggested that a nine to one ratio punitive to compensatory is just about at the constitutional limit, that as soon as the punitive award is 10 times more than the compensatory awards, it's constitutionally suspect and probably would trigger an appeal and possibly a reversal. The court also suggested, though, that where the compensatory damages are extremely high, perhaps in the tens of millions of dollars, that you wouldn't need a whole lot of punitive damages to send a deterrent um, or punitive message to the defendant. So here a one to one ratio might seem to be appropriate. The final factor is whether or not there were or are other civil sanctions that the defendant could face. That is, are there other possible liability actions that the defendant might face where the defendant also might have to pay punitive damages or compensatory damages? Um, and also whether or not there are fines that exist in that particular state that shed some light on what the appropriate amount of punitive damage should be. So in the State Farm case, there was actually a Utah fraud statute that um, prescribed a $10,000 fine for the kind of bad faith that the insurance company had demonstrated there. And so the multi-million dollar, in fact, $145 million punitive award seemed way out of proportion to that. Now, this is a very flexible balancing analysis. And certainly, if you have one factor that weighs especially heavily, it can make up for some of the others. And ultimately, the court really has just provided this as some additional guidance that jurors and ultimately judges can use to kind of rein in punitive damages, which I think the Supreme Court at least thought had kind of run away and gotten overboard over the course of years.